verse 47 through 58. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed any moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Now hold that in mind. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Notice verse number 52. In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, and we shall be changed at the sound of the last trump. Now, read in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded... And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Trumpets has played a very important role in the life of the children of Israel. Trumpets in Bible days were blown by men, by priests, and by warriors, and by angels. If you have studied the Old Testament at all very much, you will find that trumpets has played a very important part in the life of Israel. Men, priests, warriors, and angels. Now, there were two trumpets that were very outstanding in Israel. Number one, when they sounded the trumpet for an assembly. Number two, when they sounded the trumpet for battle. Trumpets were not strange things in Bible days. They were very well accustomed to trumpets. And I think that's a reason that God has chosen this way to raise the dead, by the sound of the trumpet. All the parables that Jesus ever taught in his ministry, whatever he taught and whenever he taught, he would always use something that the people understood. The seed the ground, whatever the case might have been. He did not go over their heads in parables because they understood what he was talking about. When he chose the method of a trumpet to raise the dead, he knew that people in Bible days would understand exactly what he was talking about. Now, here is where all the confusion has come about the rapture of the church in the midst of tribulation. And that is, Paul said that we will be changed at the last trump. The trumpet shall sound, and we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Then they come to Revelation chapter 11. Chapter 11, when the seventh angel sounded his trumpet of judgment, and they go back to what Paul said, that we'll be changed 
at the last trump. And they tell me that in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, when the angel sounds the trumpet of judgment, that the church will be raptured in the midst or the middle of the tribulation. And they use these scriptures to prove it. Now, I'm going to take the same scriptures and disprove that teaching. Oh, Brother Gammon, are you sure? If I wasn't sure, I wouldn't be up here. I know where I am, and I know where I'm going, and I know what I'm going to do before I get through. I'm going to read you now three scriptures. Revelation chapter 4, the first two verses. Revelation chapter 4 and the first two verses. Here is a very important scripture to prove my point. Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. As I preached in the lesson last evening, I proved that John was a symbol of the rapture of the church when the door was opened in heaven, and a voice like a trumpet was talking with John. He told him to come up hither, and I will show these things that must be hereafter. Now I go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 relative to the sounding of the trump of God. I'm going to set forth some truth tonight that there is a great deal of difference between the trump of God and the trumpet of angels. Now that's where we are standing tonight. There's a vast difference between the trump of God and the trump of angels. Notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or dead, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent. The word prevent means proceed. We shall not precede them which are asleep or dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, what is it that's going to call the dead to life and translate to living? This Bible tells me it's going to be the sounding of the trump of God. Not an angel. Not an angel, but the sounding of the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, these scriptures that I have read, and you'll hear it now, let me repeat 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the verse that I read, 47 through 48, but I'll just take this part of what I have already read in your hearing. We shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Revelation chapter 11, 15, that I have read, the trumpets of angels is not the trump of God. Notice real carefully the rapture, my friend, will take place when the trump of God sounds. The angel had a trumpet of judgment. Now, there's a lot of difference between the trump of God that will rapture the saints than the angel when he comes and sounds his trumpet to pour out the wrath 
of an angry God upon men and women. You hear me tonight, my friend. If you are saved from anything, you are saved from the wrath that is to come. The Bible teaches me that. We are saved not only from sin. We are saved not only from hellfire and brimstone, but we are saved from the wrath of God that is to be revealed against the children of disobedience. The church is not a disobedient group of people. Why would God want to pour out His wrath upon His own children? Pray tell me that. Now I want you to notice the trumpets of judgment. The rapture is the trump of God. That is deliverance. You hear me tonight? The rapture is the trump of God. That means deliverance from this vile body of ours, from this sick body, from this body of decay, from this body that has suffered untold agony and pain, at one time will die unless the rapture takes place. The rapture is a note of victory. The rapture, the trump at the rapture, represents deliverance from this vile body. And we shall have a glorious body like His. Hallelujah! No defeat at the rapture. But the angel, the seventh angel, comes and sounds His trumpet of judgment. Notice the difference between the trump of God and the trump of the angel. Hallelujah! The trumpet that will be sounded at the rapture is the trumpet of deliverance. But the trumpet that shall be sounded by the angel specifies this judgment. The wrath of God that's poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world and not upon His church. So I'm going to pull the church all the way down through here. Go through all of the opening of the seals. All of this, the pale horse, the black horse, the red horse, the white horse, and all of these things, they want to pull the church, the body of Christ, down here to chapter 11 and rapture the church at the sound of the seventh angel, which is a trumpet of judgment. I don't teach that. I teach right here. When this last church age comes to a close and God pulls the curtain down up on the last church, Notice carefully, in Revelation chapter 3, immediately in chapter 4, there was a voice like a trumpet that called John and said, Come up hither, I've got things to show you. That was the trump of God. John was a symbol of the rapture of the church, and he heard that voice as it were a trumpet. When did it take place? Not down here. It took place when God pulled the curtain down on the last church that represented the last period of time in the church age. The third chapter and the last verse, immediately he raises the curtain on chapter 4 and the voice sounded like a trumpet. Hallelujah! That, my friend, is the rapture of the catching away of the New Testament church. If you're saved from anything, you're saved from judgment. You're saved from hellfire and brimstone. I don't know, people's got the idea when the rapture comes that everybody's going up in the rapture and that's where he's going to separate the good from the bad and the sheep from the goats. So wrong. When the rapture comes, everybody that's ready is going in the rapture. There'll be no separation. If you can just get in the rapture, you got it made. He's not going to consign anybody to hell at the rapture. Everybody that goes in the rapture will remain there to receive their reward. I believe in rewards in heaven and degrees in hell. If not, why would there be a judgment seat of Christ for the church? We're going to receive the rewards for the service we've done in the kingdom of God. Rewards, rewards. Hallelujah. Trumpets of judgment. The trumpet of the rapture. Now, there is a distinction between the trump of God and the trump of angels. I'm going to show you tonight, by the help of the Lord, two places in Holy Scripture where God sounded a trumpet. I'm going to show you two places where God sounded a trumpet. Now, if there wasn't but two, 
the first one is the first, and the second one is the last. We're going to be raptured at the last trump. Now, come on, everybody. That's what the Scripture says. I'm going to show you where God sounded the first trumpet. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And I shall set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that you know that you go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not in hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that they would thunder and lightnings and thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Now, that's the first time that God ever sounded a trumpet was when he called the people of Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai, and Moses was going up on or into that mountain. Now, that's when God sounded his first trumpet. For what purpose? For an assembly of people to bring the people together. That was when he sounded the first trumpet. Now when he sounds the second trumpet or the last trumpet will be at the rapture. What for? An assembly of people worldwide, the blood bought, the spirit filled men and women, boys and girls, that is plunged in that fountain of sinner that has come out a blood washed child of God. It will be an assembly of blood washed men and women that shall hear the sound of the last trump of God. He only sounded two, the first and the second or the first and the last. Notice the difference. Over here in chapter 11, now, wouldn't that be some place to rapture a church when there would be uh, judgments falling? Look over here where I've got the church. Look what a beautiful throne up here. Oh, it's so pleasing to be raptured right here. Beautiful throne. One set on the throne. Everything was so nice up there. But over here in judgment, if people could only understand what I'm preaching tonight, you know what would happen to this church? You know what would happen to everybody in this room tonight? These carpets would be stained with tears between now and midnight tonight. If people could realize how close to the rapture that we really are. Now the question has been raised. If I miss the rapture, What's going to happen? I'll go into that fully and thoroughly one night. If you miss the rapture, I've got full direction for anybody who misses the rapture. Let me tell you, friend, the rapture is coming. It is coming. Listen, there are two stages of the coming of Christ. He is coming twice. The first time He comes, He's coming in the rapture. The world will not see Him. He's coming in the rapture. His feet will not touch the earth in a place. He's coming in midair. The Bible said, when the church is gone in the rapture into the heavens above, then the scripture teaches that God will turn his attention to the Jews, principally the Jews upon the earth, the earth dwellers. There's two kinds of people. There is a people that's going to dwell in the heavens. The other people are earth dwellers. They're living upon the earth. And immediately when this church is gone... Then in chapter 6, the seals are open, and the four horses of Revelation, they come forth. 
and everything that God has ever said that would take place in here is going to take place. When He comes the first time, He's coming in the rapture. Together, He's redeemed unto Himself. While the church is in the heavens above, receiving their crowns, rewards for what they've done in the kingdom of God, all of this will be transpiring upon the earth. The angels will come, pronounce judgment, pull out their vows. The beast will arise to power. There will be a false religious system. All of these things will take place. Somebody said, will there be a church here after the church is gone? Right here. Yes, sir. There will be a church all down through here. It will be a false church, a false religious system. The false prophet will sit at the head of that church. The beast, the Antichrist, will sit at the head of the systemized form of government. A political kingdom. They'll join hands for a while. This harlot woman will ride this beast into power and will be recognized as the religion of that day. But let me tell you, friend, the true church will be gone. The false church will be left upon this earth. But thank God in Revelation chapter 19, the heavens will open. This is when all eyes will see Him. Not over here, but over here. Two stages of His coming. His first coming is for His saints. The second coming is with His saints. Every eye shall see Him. The tribes of the earth shall mourn the cause of Him. What a difference. What a difference. We're praying. We're looking for the soon return of our blessed Redeemer and Lord. While over here, when the earth and the world sees Him, they're going to beat their breast and wring their hands. The translation tells me, it's coming, my friend. It's coming. But thank God, there's a way out. There's a way out. And that out is through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! At the sound of the trump of God, the last trumpet, the last trumpet, two stages of His coming, the rapture here, the revelation over there. I want you to drop something here. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. God deals in the figure seven. Seven denotes fullness or completeness with God. I want you to note, now this is not all the figure sevens that he has used. You might recall one while I'm talking. God has chosen the figure seven for completeness our fullness. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. There were seven churches, the seven spirits of God, seven pastors of the seven local churches, seven days in a week, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven vials of wrath. Do you know why the beast is going to be numbered 666? Is because the figure six is the figure of a man. It's the number of a man. Six is lesser than seven. Seven denotes completeness with God. The beast is a man, and he will have the number of a man. Six is lesser than seven. That is imperfection. It's not complete. It's not full. That's why the beast, the man of sin, will take a man's number, because he is a man. Now, Enoch was the seventh from Adam. I want to read a verse that this man prophesied many centuries ago. Jude chapter 1, verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. And all of their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Did you get that? A long time ago. It's been nearly 2,000 years since Calvary. Enoch lived a long time in the distant past. But he was a man that walked with God. Now, Enoch is the type of the translation of the church. 
Noah, his family, and the ark. That's the type of the Jews that will go through tribulation and be saved. But Enoch was translated before the flood. The saints will be translated before judgments. Will be translated before wrath. Hallelujah. I want to show you something here. Enoch was warned of the judgment of the flood. A storm of divine wrath that was going to come to destroy the people off of the earth. You know, Bible names, they mean something. Every proper name in the Bible has a very distinct meaning. Enoch was warned of the judgment of the flood. When he was 65 years old, he fathered a child. He was called Methuselah. Now, the meaning of Methuselah is this. When he is dead, it will come. He lived 969 years, and he died before the flood came. Brother, you've come too late to tell me that my God doesn't know what he's talking about. When Enoch fathered this child, he was 65 years old, and he named him a name that meant, When he is dead, it will come. And 969 years later it came. Now, why did Enoch live? I mean, why did Methuselah live so long? Well, back there they didn't smoke cigarettes. They didn't drink hard liquor like people drink today. And on top of all that, there wasn't as much traffic and there wasn't as many streets to cross. That's the reason that he lived so long. 969 years. That's longer than I'm going to live in this world. Now, can you think that God spoke to his father? And told him the flood was coming. Oh, you may say, that's great. But look what else he told Enoch over here. A long time before it ever came to pass. Way back here in the distant past. I want you to know carefully that God spoke to that man. You know what kind of testimony he had? He had a testimony that he pleased God. And he was not because God took him. He said he's coming with 10,000 of his saints. Well, I've never been able to understand how in the world can the saints come back with him until they get up there with him to come back with him. That's what I can never understand. You see, he comes over here and raptures his saints. Then they go up here to have a great fine time just looking at Jesus and receiving rewards. And then over here, when all the wolves of this earth is going on and people are running and screaming and crying, running to the rocks and to the mountains and having a prayer meeting and praying that the rocks and the mountains will fall upon them to hide the face of Him that sitteth upon the throne and all of these prayers that's going on. All at once the heavens are going to burst with the glory of God. And you're going to see a white charger start out. Hallelujah. Praise God. And the one that sits upon this white charger, the Bible said, he had a name on his vesture and on his thigh. His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Notice carefully now. I'm going back to 1 Corinthians 15 and 52. See, they tell me in all these Bible schools that repetition is one of the finest methods of teaching. You know, people don't grasp what you say a lot of times. They just don't grasp what you say. Some little children can understand better than grown-up people. I can preach my heart out about a certain given thing and after church, somebody will come up and ask me a question direct opposite of what I preach. And said, well, explain it to me. Well, I take time do the best I can. Sometimes children catch on quicker than grown-ups. The little boy sitting in a Sunday school class, and that teacher was teaching away. She said, don't you know that Noah had a great time during the flood fishing out of that ark? That little boy said, with two words? He knew there wasn't a big can of worms on that ark. Sometimes they catch on quicker than grown-ups do. Hear me tonight, friend. If I could get everybody, just half of you, to believe what I'm talking about tonight, 
We need to have a revival here tonight. Hallelujah. You know, the Lord may come before we get out of this church tonight. Wouldn't this be a good atmosphere to be caught up in the rapture in tonight? Wouldn't it be a good atmosphere? Somebody said, well, you know, I've had people to tell me this. Now, Brother Gannon, I'm going to wait until uh, the rapture and I'm going to wait till all the judgments and all through this tribulation period and then I'm going to get right with God. You let me tell you something. If you can't get right with God in the atmosphere that's in this church tonight, you won't ever get right down here. You won't ever get right down here. Now, people are counting on that. I've had them to tell me that. I'm not going to pray now, but I will. Oh, yes, probably so. But you're going to be praying against a heaven that's turned to brass. I like to pray when I know my prayer is going somewhere. Amen. And this life is too short. Eternity is too long to miss the will of God. Let me repeat that. This life is too short. Eternity is too long to miss what I'm talking about here tonight in the rapture, the glories of heaven. Let me tell you something. Some people that tell me they're going to get right down here. You know, if a person cannot live for God, they'll never die for it. If you can't live for Him, you'll never die for it. You'll never die for it. Now notice carefully. First Corinthians fifteen fifty two, and the seventh trump in Revelation are not the same. Just as much difference between the two trumpets. This one is the trump of God. This is the trump of an angel. This angel's trumpet pronounced judgment and woe. This trumpet is the trump of God. It promised deliverance, freedom, eternal life, a crown of righteousness. that will fade not away. Hallelujah. Can you say praise the Lord? Now, I want to show you a little bit further here. In Ephesians 5, you read Scripture like this. When Paul describes the church and himself, that he's likened to a man and his wife. You know what Paul said? He said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Did you know there's a number of mysteries in the Bible? But the mystery of the church will be finished at the rapture. There will be no more mystery in the church. When the church is raptured, the mystery of the church will be finished. The church will have no connection with anything going on down here in the earth. It's in the heavens. Now, I said that to tell you from Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. Here's another strong argument, and I want you to take this home with you tonight. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7. Now notice, chapter 10 and verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound... The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Two mysteries here. They will be finished. The mystery of the church will be finished at the rapture. The mystery of God will be finished at the sounding of the seventh angel in the tribulation period. To me, that's noteworthy. Two mysteries. The Bible gives us a number of mysteries. The mystery of iniquity. The mystery of godliness. Then it goes on to teach about the mystery of the church. These two mysteries are separate things altogether. The rapture is the trump of deliverance. While the trumpet of the angels, they are trumpets of wrath and judgment and the woes of an angry God at the rapture, my friend. 
at the rapture. Notice this carefully. The mystery of the church will be finished. In Revelation chapter 10, when he describes the sounding of the seventh angel, and in Revelation chapter 11, when he sounds, then that will finish the mystery of God. Two trumpets with two mysteries, just as far apart as daylight is from dark. If men would look at what I'm talking about up here tonight, you'd have a better understanding of the future of the church and the future of the world. The church has a bright future. I said the church has a bright future. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now somebody says, tell me now. Something about how it's going to happen. All right. I'm going to Romans, the 8th chapter. And I'm going to show you how it's going to happen. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. But you're not in the flesh... But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Paul said that. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. I'm going to say, I think I can get by without the Holy Ghost. No. It's essential. Somebody asked me right here, not too long ago, did I believe the Holy Ghost was essential to salvation? I said, no. They said, you don't? I said, no. They said, what do you believe about it? I said, the Holy Ghost is not essential to salvation. It is your salvation. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Hallelujah! When He comes in the rapture, His feet will not touch the earth any place when He comes in the rapture. When He comes in the revelation, His feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives. And the mountain is going to cleave in the midst thereof. And a very great valley is going to be formed. I went on top of uh, the Mount of Olives. And I probably never did, but I had a desire in my heart. I walked with all the time I had. I said, if I could just somehow stand in the same spot that Jesus stood in when he left here 2,000 years ago. I walked back and forth. I said, maybe I'll hit the spot somewhere around here where he was standing. But when he comes in the rapture, his feet will not touch the earth any place. But when he comes over here in the revelation, his feet is going to stand on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is going to cleave, and a very great valley is going to be formed. He's coming here. The mystery of the church will be finished. Over here, the mystery of God will be finished at the sounding of the seventh angel. Then he's about ready now to come back. To meet the false prophet, the beast, and the devil. And he's going to defeat them. And it won't take long because he has a sword that proceeds out of his mouth. Hallelujah. Then tell me he's not powerful. He has all power in heaven and in earth. Hallelujah. His name is Jesus. That's a saving name. That's a powerful name. But now when he comes in midair, his feet is not going to touch the earth anywhere. He's going to come across the world just like a high-powered magnet. One day I was driving down the road in Mississippi years ago with a man. And ahead we saw a road machine. Back in those days we didn't have any paved roads and hardly any gravel roads. Just dirt roads. And they'd send this road machine around ever so often to... Work up the road where you could get along the best you could. And underneath that road machine, there was an object. Pretty big affair. And that man said, you know what that is? I said, I have no idea. He said, that's a magnet. He said, that is placed underneath this machine that when this road machine does its work, anything that has metal in it, nails, piece of steel, or anything that would damage automobile tires out of the dirt 
the sand, and if there was any gravel. Out of the gravel, the dirt, and the sand, this magnet would attract anything that had metal in it. And out of the dirt, it would rise and cling to the magnet. When Christ comes, He's just going to pass over the earth. And everybody that's got metal in you, what is that metal? That's the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's the Holy Ghost that raised him up from the dead. Hallelujah. If you've been dead 2,000 years, that makes no difference. If you've been dead 50 years, that makes no difference. You hear me as I preach tonight. There's something, my friend, that a saint of God will take to the graveyard with him. That one day when Christ shall pass over that cemetery, they will arise to meet the Lord. Hallelujah. And they will arise to meet him in peace. First John chapter 3, verse 1, beloved. Now are we the sons of God. Not after a while, but right now. We ought to rejoice in the fact that we are now the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. That's the hope of the child of God. Then again in Philippians, I read this. There'll be a day when He's going to take our vile bodies. You know, that word vile, that means our bodies of humiliation. He said, our conversation is in heaven. That word conversation means citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're down here just to spend a little time. We're just passing through. We are not permanent dwellers down here. We're just here for a while to support the government and to pay taxes. You know, if there's life on Mars, they had more sense than we did. We spent $30 billion to find out if there was life up there, and they never spent anything to find out if there's anything down here. Well, they got more sense than we had. But we do all of these things. We're just uh, passing through for a little while. It won't be long until our journey will be over. We're just passing through, and it won't be long. Just don't get attached to anything down here. Just kind of let, let it go loose, you know. And just get by. Make a living, and uh, then get ready for the rapture. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Just get ready for the rapture. But he said our conversation is in heaven. That means our citizenship is in heaven. From which we look. For our Savior to return. And He's going to take our bodies of humiliation. And the Bible said He's going to fashion them. Not after the fashions of Paris. But He's going to fashion them into a glorious body like His. Starting out to the resurrection. I'm glad the graveyard is not the stopping point. Somebody said, that's the end. That's just the beginning. I said, that's just the beginning. The sound of the last trumpet. God had two, and he's going to sound the last one. The second one right here. Over here on Sinai, he gathered the people together at the foot of the mountain. Here, he's going to gather us together in the heavens. Though our sins are scarlet. You have made us white as snow Though our sins are scarlet You have made us white as snow I know a place where mercy flows Take the stains, make it wider than snow We're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray yeah, yeah. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water and rise up in a
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the 